Um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, and and yeah, I'm delighted to see you here tonight in person. Um, I'd like to particularly welcome Adam Rutherford um, and, and, for, and thank you in advance for the talk tonight. Um, and welcome our guests um, from outside Wolfson and then all our Wolfson family, fellows, staff, students, um, alumni who I know are here and actually also um, those watching online. So welcome to this uh, Lee Seng Ti Distinguished Lecture of uh, 2021. Um, the, the hall that we're, that we're in, for those who don't know, is, is the Lee Seng Ti Hall. Um, and here is Dr. Lee Seng Ti. Um, he was born in April 1923 and he's still alive. Um, and still going strong. Last time I saw him was two years ago, and he was still going into the office every day. Um, um, businessman, philanthropist, and um, honorary fellow of this college. Um, one of the other gardens, a shame it's not sunny, because out there we have the Betty Wu Lee Garden, named after um, his wife, who is also still alive. Um, and we also have outside in the next court there, uh, the Lee Library. Um, and, and it's a place that all our students are welcome, uh, 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 what, thank him for almost daily. It's open 24, 7, 365 days of the year. I have seen students go in on Christmas Day and on New Year's Day. So it really is a, a place of research. And we have this pineapple on, on the stage here, and around the college we've got these little pineapples. And um, the story of how, we, how where these pineapples got, uh, um, come from and why uh, saying he wanted to support Wilson is quite a nice one, and it's to do with research and it's to do with biology for you. Um, uh, he, he dropped his daughter off here at college one day, so the story goes, and it, um, that's the way I tell it. Um, and a fellow said to him, I'll give you a lift back to the station. And on the way back to the station, fortunately we don't live really close to the station, so there's plenty of time for conversation. Um, it turned out that Seng Ti um, was a pineapple magnate, had many pineapple plantations in Malaysia, uh, and they, they were dying, and he was concerned for his wealth. The fellow happened to be a plant biologist. So in this short trip, they arranged that he would pay, saying he would pay for a student and a postdoc to work on the problem of these dying pineapples. They came up with a solution. They saved his pineapples, and we have this lovely hall. We have a beautiful garden, a fabulous library, and because in honor of the, the role that research plays, Research within the university, but also we're a college that where research is what our students mainly do. He set up the and he gave a, an endowment for our dis annual distinguished lecture. Uh, this year, our distinguished lecturer is Adam Rutherford. Um, it, it's it's very difficult. I I am. I'm a scientist. Those of you who know me know that you cut me and I bleed scientists. Um, and, and Adam Rutherford is somebody I've been following for a long time on podcasts, in articles. Um, and, and I am, he's one of the, what I admire him most for is the way he presents science and what scientists do. It's, it, science is something you do, it's not something you just read about or think about. And it's all about evidence. It's about looking for evidence. It's about interpreting that evidence. It's, being, it's about being impartial and open-minded. I think that, um, and, and it was difficult, because I, I met him today for the first time and said, hello, Adam, we just started speaking. I've, ne I've never met him before, but I do know that a, a fox ate his trainers, because th that was on Rutherford, and that was on Twitter, probably. Um, I do know he's got a dog called Jess, who he thinks loves him. Um, uh, uh, you, you, when, when, you, 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 when you're on podcasts and, and you're, you're on the Rutherford and Fry program and you tweet, you learn an awful lot about something, uh, somebody, even though you, that you've never met him before. I also know that, that he's a little bit mass phobic, so or he, he, he pretends he's mass phobic, maybe. But um, recently he won 
uh, the, the Royal Society David Attenborough Award of 2021 for his contribution to uh, the public understanding of biology and science, making the, the public understand what science is, how it's done, and why it's important. Um, he also won it for his recent work um, looking at the pseudoscience of race. Um, and so tonight, he's actually going to sort of tick me off a bit about my understanding that scientists are completely, you know, we're completely um, meticulous and we only stick by the rules. And he'll, he'll maybe look at some of the ways where science has not been so meticulous. Um, so, Adam, um, we're, we're pleased to have you here. Yours is the last lecture in our series of Wilson Explores Borders for this last year. And if there were ever a time when there were borders being put up between people of different kinds uh, and, and, and of different understanding between science and the non-sciences, bet between the races, now is the time to explore that. And also, it is the last talk of this year for in our Let's Talk About Race and Racism initiative that's been going on in the college. You're talking at the end of a week where the Daily Telegraph has been having a go at us for um, uh, expecting that our students will go to anti-racism workshops. We're proud of that. We're proud of the students here who organised that. We've got nothing to uh, apologise for. And uh, I hope that they find out that they're doing this because we'll be even more woke than we were this morning <laughs> when they see that. So uh, thank you for coming, Adam, uh, and welcome to Wilson. Thank you, Jane. Uh, that's a very generous introduction. I don't know why you think Jessie doesn't love me. I mean, you, the, the implication was that my dog doesn't love me, which is just, I find very strange. You also didn't mention the, the real reason we, we, uh, we sort of linked up in the first place, which is that I heard you on the radio and contacted you because you had suggested that I had said, I had said, that the best scientific conversations happen not at conferences, but in conference bars. So I'll do this quickly so we can... We can um, we, we can demonstrate that that is indeed the case. Well, thank you for inviting me. I was also slightly I need to apologise in advance because I did think that this was in Oxford until about two days ago. <laughs> um, but being from UCL, I, I don't really understand the difference. <laughs> How to win a Cambridge audience in your first minute. Anyway, so um, th yes, this is, th this, this is my talk. So this is... This is um, uh, a, a branch of my work which has emerged from writing books about the history of, of genetics and biology more broadly, so the obligatory plug, so the, my, a book that I wrote a few years ago which is a sort of broad sweep of, of human evolutionary history uh, using genetics, using DNA as a sort of source text uh, in which I touch upon some of the ideas of uh, historical race and also eugenics which is um, um, part, part of what I'm going to be talking about tonight. And that formed the basis of my next two books, How to Argue with the Racist, which is out, and was out last year, but also my next book, which is about the history of eugenics, uh, which won't be out until February. But we revealed the cover today, so you're the first people to see what the cover actually looks like, a rather ominous and threatening, appropriately threatening looking book. So tonight I'm going to be talking about race and the history of race and the invention of race and the relationship between race, biology, genetics, and, and scientific racism. Um, and I want to, I want you to think of, I want, I, want, I want to seed two ideas in your head which are challenging to what Jane said at, at the beginning. Because we do think of science as being amoral and apolitical and above the grubby world of, of opinion and politics. We aim for a, a higher standard of evidence than other branches of how we know things. That is the principle of, of science. However, I think it's fundamentally untrue. And I, I'm going to argue that throughout this lecture. I argue it in all of my work. I want you to, to be thinking and, uh, as, a, as a means of, as a sort of framework for debate more than anything else, that data is never neutral and that science is always political. And there's a third, because this is an academic audience, um, there's a third uh, branch of this, which is that within genetics, within evolutionary biology particularly, um, we don't really have the language to describe what it is that we do. And this is a fundamental problem in communicating ideas about um, 
human diversity, genetic diversity and human evolution, and its ties to historical uh, scientific racism. So why are we talking about this now? Well, I, I mean, I, I introduced this slide ages ago when I felt that uh, I needed to be justifying why we're talking about race in 2021, but I, I feel it's a little bit redundant now. Race and racism are uh, dominant conversations in our public discourse for multiple reasons, which are some of which I've listed up on the screen that are relevant to us now. But we've got a, we've had we've experienced a changing landscape of politics over the last ten years and a rise of populism, and. In the last 20 years, since the first publication of the draft sequence of the Human Genome Project uh, in 2000, uh, we've seen an enormous sort of exponential growth in our understanding of human genetics and genetics more broadly, sort of seeded by that, that sort of that hub, um, that, that, that moment in, in time when the Human Genome Project was completed. Uh, and for people like me, and I think it should be by extension for anyone who works within genetics, we've also seen an enormous matching popular interest in, in genetics, partly because of the work that geneticists are, are, are doing in understanding DNA and how um, it, 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 it contributes to our understanding of the human journey, of, the, of what it means to be human and, and its relationship to um, biology and medicine. Um, but also something I don't think geneticists predicted, which is the emergence of the commercial ancestry um, uh, genetics market, and a, a huge multi-billion dollar industry, um, which I think it now in some ways almost dominates public conversations about genetics, um, and particularly genetics in relation to race and ancestry, in ways that I think that is not necessarily good for the public understanding of genetics. Um, and how uh, DNA becomes a person. So th these, this is the sort of framework for what I want to talk about. It's the framework for, for much of my work um, in both sort of academic discourse, but also in the public understanding of genetics. Now, here's a, here's a slide, another idea that I want you to sort of think about during the course of this talk. And really, this is, this is aimed at my geneticist colleagues and my, my biologist colleagues who don't necessarily uh, engage with these ideas because... I don't think many geneticists got into working um, in their particular fields, thinking about the history of their subject and knowing the history of their subject. But one of the things I'm going to argue is that we have to. Uh, we, we absolutely have to engage with the history of genetics because it's a pernicious history, but it's one that has a very positive trajectory uh, in terms of understanding um, human biodiversity and, and the concepts of race. Now, obviously, this is a serious talk, and I'm a very serious person, as I think Jane has uh, correctly identified in her introduction, uh, Jesse, my dog, who does love me. Um, there are the occasional shaft of light in this otherwise serious field, and one of them comes, when you, when you write about race, when you write about genetics, you become a target for um, trolling and hate mail and death threats, which I get on a semi-regular basis, and they're pretty toothless. Um, uh, and I know that many people get them much worse and much more seriously. And so it's, a, it's slightly water off a duck's back for me. Um, but a couple of years ago, when I, th I think the, the hardback of How to Argue with the Racist had just come out, um, a white supremacist website called VDARE, it's a proper neo-Nazi website. I spend quite a lot of time on neo-Nazi websites so that you don't have to, um, uh, did a profile on me. Um, and, and they kind of doxed me in this as well by having my email address and telephone number, which was unfortunate. Um, but anyway, there was a part of this, this profile of, of my existence. I, I just want I, I to, I will read it out because it, I, I feel like this should be a sort of, it's a slightly sort of rock star ominous introduction by neo-Nazis. Um, so it goes like this. There is a particular science writer and broad... I don't know why that's in parentheses. I, mean, I literally am a science writer and broadcaster whom our rulers wheel out again and again to add authority to fallacious criticisms of the concept of race. I, I, I don't think I've ever been wheeled out by anyone. Um, it goes on and says, his insidious influence over the scientific illiterates who constitute such a large portion of the West, including of its elite, is substantial. <laughs> I mean, insidious influence is just great, isn't it? I, I can't get my children to brush their teeth at night. <laughs> so God knows how I can control a large portion of the West. Um, his name is Dr. Adam Rutherford. So that's me. Um, and that's my introduction according to uh, neo-Nazis. So um, that's fun. Anyway, so, so let me get on with this. Um, 
the, the concept of race, which has historical, specific uh, and inseparable historical associations with the birth of biology. When I said that the trajectory of the concept of race and the, and the, the, the history of our field of biology more broadly, but specifically anthropology and genetics and those sort of associated fields, um, the trajectory is positive because by the end of the 20th century, we had established pretty much unequivocally that the concept of race, having been bound to biological ideas since its inception, is not uh, a, a biologically meaningful or useful way of categorizing or taxonomizing people. And so we refer to race as a social construct as a result of that. Now, you know, a lot of people, sometimes when you get into discourse with uh, people on, on social media and, and in the media more general, generally, they use the concept of a social construct as some way damaging to the, the, the concept overall, that somehow social constructions are less valuable than biological constructions, which is what race is argued to be. Now, this is a pretty moronic argument, to be perfectly honest, because you don't have biological relationships with very many people during the course of your life, unless you're extremely good looking. Um, but we have social constructs, we have social interactions with almost all humans that, that we meet. And in fact, you know, other things that are social constructs that we really don't challenge things like money or time. You know, both of these things are social constructs, but you never get people saying, I'm not going to pay you because money is, a, is socially constructed and therefore not real, or I'm not turning up to this meeting on time because time is entirely arbitrary and decided on social conventions. And yet you do get people saying, well, you say that race is a social construct, therefore your argument is in, invalid. It's a very silly argument to take. It's a silly position to, to take. Social constructs are the way that most people interact with most other human beings. Sometimes this gets framed as uh, with, with, with the, the idea that race does not exist. Now, this is incorrect. I know this is well-meaning, and I know this is, this is an attempt by people to say that race is not biologically important or meaningful and is a social construct, but the framing of the concept of race as, as not existing is incorrect. Race exists because it is a social construct and has enormous importance in how we socially categorize people and how we interact with people uh, around the world. And so race absolutely does exist. It exists because it is a social construct. And I think it's important that we get that right, no matter how well-intentioned you are in, in deconstructing the biological understanding of race, it is important to recognize that it is a real thing. Okay, now the history of this, the history of, of the, the invention of race is, is what I, I want to talk about in most of the first half of this, um, is, is, is largely predicated on events and classification systems and geopolitical events that begin to emerge in the 16th, 17th and, and 18th century. And for the most part, they are predicated on, on uh, one particular phenotype, which is pigmentation. So I'm going to talk about the history of pigmentation in, in biology um, uh, for the first bit. So um, this very obvious phenotype, this, we are very visual species, and one of the first things we see about people is the color of their skin. And in the invention, in the construction of race, pigmentation becomes the primary determinant of what become the racial categorizations that we broadly still adhere to today. So it's worth trying to deconstruct and, and expose the history of the, the idea of pigmentation as a, uh, uh, and its utility in classifying people. And um, it, it, pigmentation descriptions of variation in pigmentation are part of our well, the, the earliest works, in, at least in the Western canon, Homer in the Iliad refers to um, pigmentation of various different people. He talks about um, Odysseus as being swarthy um, and dark-skinned at some points and pale-skinned in other parts, which probably indicates that Homer was not necessarily one single person. He talks about um, the uh, broadly sub-Saharan African people, um, and uses the word atheops to describe them, which comes from the Greek, a, a, a conflation of two words meaning blackened or burnt skin. So we have the first descriptions in the earliest works of the Western canon that's, that singularly refer to pigmentation. Now, there is a fundamental difference in the way that, uh, that classical and uh, ancient historical texts refer to pigmentation compared to the way that they begin to be referred to in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries and onwards, which is they're not fundamentally associated with uh, the othering of different groups of people or uh, cultural battles or indeed real battles. And so the criteria that we use more broadly um, throughout the, the classical world for 
uh, you know, wanting to take over or destroy or fight uh, other cultures tend to be religious or language or geographically based, and there's very little evidence that pigmentation, that skin colour, is, uh, is, is part of the, of the way that you wish to contest um, another population. And, and that's broadly, I mean, I've just got one slide on this, there's a whole chapter on this in the, in the book, but um, that's, that's broadly the way that the West thinks about pigmentation uh, throughout the classical canon. Now, this, I'm going to scoop forward about, oh, I don't know, a couple of thousand years um, and uh, re make reference to the great Uzbeki philosopher-scientist Avicenna. Now, Avicenna is important in this discourse because he describes in one of his texts what we think might be a very early or if not the first description of pigmentation and associating it with particular behavioral characteristics as a specific means of justifying the subjugation of people. So this occurs in the 11th century and refers to the Islamic slave trade, which lasted for many centuries, many millions of people enslaved during this, uh, during this period. But he describes... Uh, so the warning here, I'm going to be using some language which is, a pr which is, uh, is uncomfortable, for, potentially uncomfortable for us uh, today, but is part of the quotations of, of um, the historical quotations. And so he, Avicenna refers to um, dark-skinned Africans as being fickle and foolish and therefore justifies, that, 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 that those behaviours associated with the, their pigmentation justifies the subjugation of, of these people. He also describes pale-skinned Northern Europeans as being ignorant and lacking discernment, which justifies their enslavements during the Islamic slave trade as well. So there is a different model from the one that emerges a few centuries later as European colonialization and European expansion begins to take hold. But it is, it's an early and possibly the first specific example of skin color being associated with particular behavioral characteristics in the service of an ideology, which in this case is the subjugation and enslavement of, of nations. So this is happening a few hundred years before the emergence of what, what we fondly call the Enlightenment or the Scientific Revolution or the Renaissance and all those, those very uh, positive sounding terms about European expansion and, and colonialization. And, and so for the next few minutes, let me, let me talk about some of the key figures in the, the so-called Enlightenment, a term that many historians are beginning to have uh, serious problems with. And I don't know how I feel about that, and maybe that's, that's something for us to discuss later. But we've got, uh, so left to right in the top row, we've got Linnaeus, Voltaire, uh, Immanuel Kant, we've got Johann Blumenbach, um, Thomas Huxley, and my boy Charles Darwin, uh, bottom right. I won't go through all of them in great detail, but these are some of the key figures of the scientific revolution, of the development of Western philosophy that we, we, we sort of rely on to this day. Now, it starts really with Linnaeus, most significantly. Now, I know everyone knows in this room knows exactly who Carl Linnaeus was. He was a, but I'll tell you anyway, um, he was a Swedish accountant who invented the taxonomic system that we continue to use in biology to this day. Legitimately, for that reason, the, the binomial system, Homo sapiens, we can regard him as a very significant founder of biology as it exists. Taxonomy and classification remains a core part of how we do biology today. Now, he, he mostly described this in his book, uh, his, his major work, Systema Naturae, which was published many times over the course of his life, but in the, in the 1958, 1758, uh, 10th edition, he introduces subspecies categories for humans. So he has Homo sapiens, and he has four subspecies. And for those who read Latin, you can probably see them on the screen right now. But let me just go through the first uh, three of them now. Um, so he introduces Americanus, who he describes as red-skinned, with black, straight, thick hair, stubborn, zealous, and regulated by customs. He describes Homo sapiens asiaticus as being yellow-skinned, with stiff black hair, haughty, greedy, and ruled by opinions. Africanus, or affair, Homo sapiens affair, with black skin, silky, silky black skin, frizzled hair, a flat nose, females without shame, crafty, lazy, and governed by caprice. Now, I think you can see from this that this is not a scientific um, description. This is not how we th think about classification today. The first two categories here, well, the first one is pigmentation, it's skin color. The second one is skin, uh, is uh, hair or uh, hair color or texture. And the rest of them are value judgments, right? They're, they're great criticisms. You've got a question? Yeah, because um, in, the, in this slide, there is two, there are two categories of Africans. Yes. Like 
uh, Afa and Africanus are interchangeable. Yeah. Should we do this at the end? Sure. Um, uh, because I've only listed three up there, and the, the first category is Homo sapiens um, europeanus, who are described as white-skinned with blue eyes, who are gentle, acute, inventive, and governed by laws. Right? So you begin to see a pattern here, which is universally adhered to by all of the people who work at this time in classifying humans. Right? This is not simply a classification system. This is not simply taxonomy. It is hierarchical in its nature. It is inherently um, uh, white supremacy, in a, in not, not in the way that we use it today, but fundamentally, this is biology in service of an ideology which is justifying the European expansion which is beginning to happen at this time. Um, so it starts with Linnaeus in this formal way using the textbook which defines how we define living systems uh, to this day. So this is what I mean when I say that the origin of biology and the origin of human biology particularly is inextricably intertwined with the birth of scientific race and the, cre the creation of races. Um, now, the, the discourse at this time is, is characterized by an argument, sort of polar argument between what are referred to as the monogenous and the polygenous. So you've got to remember that everyone at this time is effectively a biblical creationist. The, the um, gen Genesis is regarded as a historical text and therefore can be relied on as being accurate. Um, but there are arguments about how we see the emergence of, of different uh, phenotypes, different types of people from ar around the world. And the monogenous broadly believed um, that um, uh, the, the, that's the people of the earth come from the Garden of Eden, from the sons of Adam and Eve, and they populate the world, they migrate away from the Garden of Eden, and they develop their characteristics uh, as they are migrating away from, from wherever the Garden of Eden was, somewhere in the Middle East. The polygenists took the view that everyone migrated away from the Garden of Eden, settled in specific locations, and there developed their, their racialized characteristics, which uh, we can identify in the, in the phenotypes of skin color and hair, and, and so on. Now, one of the key proponents, probably the key proponent of the polygenist attitude, was Voltaire, right? One of the the great thinkers of the Enlightenment, one of our key uh, philosophers of, of, Western, of Western thought to this day. And I know it's really important in history that we do not judge people by contemporary standards, but by the standards of their day. I, I understand that fully. Um, I do think that that is an argument often used to exonerate historical views when we can contextualize um, the views of people from the past by comparing them to other people uh, of their time, Voltaire was an unequivocal and profound racist. I mean, a really deeply racist man who was polygenous to the extent that he thought that sub-Saharan African people were a different species, okay? And this uh, grotesque quote, which I won't read out, is indicative of, of that view. So again, we've got another founding father of Western philosophy who is broadly revered for good reasons, who is also profoundly racist in a way which sets up arguments and discussions that will persist into the 20th century. A, a bit later, we have Johann Blumenbach, a German scientist philosopher. Um, and Blumenbach is interesting because, for, well, for various reasons, but the, the one that I want to point out here is that he begins to introduce a different metric, right? So he begins to introduce morphology, craniometry, the measurement of skulls. He was sent 60 skulls from around the world from the expanding colonies as, as Europeans explored the rest of the world, and he used measurements from the skulls, from these 60 skulls, to determine that there were, in fact, five races. So he's expanded this from Linnaeus's original four. And, and this is characteristic of basically what a lot of scientists or proto-scientists are doing at this time, trying to work out these discrete essentialist categories that humans fit into. In every single case, without exception, white Europeans are regarded as superior. They're all hierarchical, and white Europeans are, are on top. Um, skip forward again and, and let's get to Darwin um, now we're, it's the 150th anniversary of the descent of man Darwin's second greatest book third if you count Voyage of the Beagle um, and in this this is a passage in which I think one interpretation which I think is I, I like um, but is to be argued about is that in describing the enormous variance in the number of, of um, 
of races that various people have come up with at this time. He's actually gently mocking the idea that there are these discrete groups, and he says that uh, they've been, humans have been classified as uh, a single species or race up to 63. Right? And no one can really decide how many races there are, and they can be argued about by the great thinkers of this time. He goes on to talk about, he goes on to apply his ideas about natural selection and the mutability of humans uh, in, in the same, in the same um, section of the book, where he talks about how that he can't imagine that these are discrete categories at all, and that these characteristics do, uh, they graduate into each other, and that he doesn't imagine, he goes on to say, that he can't, he can't imagine that they are essentialist, that they are inherent uh, to these individual groups of people, and that he can't imagine that they would stay fixed through time if they, if they uh, interbred or admixed with, with other populations. So he's kind of foreshadowing what genetics will ultimately show in the, in the late 20th century um, in that very Darwinian way that he's extremely good at doing. Um, and and that, that takes us into the middle of the 19th century, and so I mentioned Huxley as well, and Huxley's been in the news in the last week or so because Imperial um, College have decided to remove his name from their buildings, which is, again, a discussion that we may have, may have later. Huxley, um, one, one of the, probably the greatest supporter of Darwinian thinking, Darwin's bulldog was how he's referred to, um, and, uh, and a lifelong campaigner against slavery, an abolitionist. Um, now, Huxley's crack at, at de determining how many races there were are, are a bit more um, expansive than, than some of the others, and he introduces some, some words that I'm very grateful haven't stuck, like Xantho Croy and Melano Croy, but making a distinction between, as, as we are, you know, one thing I haven't pointed out and is worth saying is that almost all of those people, like um, Voltaire and Linnaeus and Blumenbach and many, many others were formulating their theories from their salons, right? Most of them never travelled at all. So this is all based on reports back or skulls sent to them or people that they meet um, in London or Paris or Berlin. One of the things that Darwin did and I think was, is, is legitimately part of his development of, of theories is, is that he travelled. He travelled extensively. So it was very much data-based. Huxley... Um, uh, similar, not quite as extensively travelled as, as Darwin. Anyway, so he comes up with a different map of the world and sees that there are different, again, based on skin colour primarily, sees that, that um, people of northern Africa, uh, referred to as the Melanocroy, people of southern Africa, he calls Negro, and there's Bushmen at, at, uh, in, in what we now refer to as South Africa. Now, I bring up Huxley for a specific reason, not to, I don't want to go through every one of these guys' um, thoughts about how many different races there are and what their classifications are, but I bring this up because um, this introduces a specific idea which I think it, it demonstrates quite how clearly our, um, the, these historical ideas about race have percolated through the centuries and persist in our culture to this day. And it's specifically in reference to the distinction made between Negro and Melanocroy. Now, this is not Huxley's work. Let me be very specific about this, but it's derived from similar thinking on this. And it concerns the Rwandan genocide of 1994. So just briefly, without going into too much detail about this, the area which is now Rwanda um, was colonised by, initially by the Germans until the beginning of the, 19th, uh, the 20th century and taken over by the Belgians. Now, the Germans wanted to maintain strong relationships with the, uh, with the Tutsi, uh, so one of, one of the major uh, ethnic groups, tribal groups within what is now Rwanda. And the Tutsi have two characteristic, which, char phenotype and characteristics which make them slightly different from the Hutu, with whom they had friendly relationships at this time in the 19th century. The first is that they are slightly paler skinned on average, and the second is that they are pastoralists, which means that they, they farm, they're dairy farmers, and they drink milk. And the Germans introduced a new um, racial categorization for the Tutsi, which is based on a made-up category of humans called the Hamites. So they invented a category of humans called Hamites, which are the descendants of Ham, um, from the Bible, and as a result of this European or, Mid or Eurasian admixture, they were more advanced, they were more sophisticated, more evolved than the Hutu, who don't have these, these characteristic European traits of paler skin and the ability to process milk. 
So the Germans introduced this, they developed this as, a, as an idea, and then the Belgian colonizers took over and they developed it further because they also wanted to maintain better relationship with the Tutsi than, than the Hutu. And by the 1920s and 30s, they'd introduced ethnic uh, identity cards. You can see Hutu and Tutsi and uh, other tribal groups there on these identity cards and, and basically promulgated a, uh, a conflict between the Hutu and the Tutsi in order to maintain power, uh, power relationships with with the, the, the Tutsi rather than the Hutu. And that is the genesis of the conflict which dominated Rwanda over the course of the 20th century. When the Belgians finally left, they installed um, uh, uh, the, uh, a, a Tutsi royal family which was overturned by the Hutu and by, and that's, this just generated, uh, just um, continues as a civil war throughout the 20th century until the conflict in 1994, uh, which is a full on genocide thousands of people murdered in the space of 100 days. And it's the first time the UN describes rape as being used as a weapon of war. The origin of that conflict, and I simplified it and turned it into a very linear narrative for this pur purpose, but the origin of that conflict starts with the invented pseudoscience of racial categorization by German scientists, embraced by Belgian scientists, uh, uh, with these made up anthropological characters such as, as the Hamites. Okay, so, now, we, let's just talk more broadly about human evolution. We, we think of ourselves as an African species. We describe ourselves as an African species. Homo sapiens um, emerged in Africa at some point over the last half a million years or so. And we use maps like this to describe the migration of people, um, our ancestors from Africa over the rest of the world. Uh, we, I, I, I refer to these as dad's army maps for reasons that about half the audience will get. Um, and I think they're useful in describing the broad sweep of human evolution, but I think they're, they're deeply misrepresentative of our current understanding of human evolution um, uh, because we're talking about geological timescapes here and, and, and we use language. And this, this, this touches on my point about we don't have the language to really describe what it is that we do. Or, uh, so the broad sweep of human evolution says, well, yeah, we started in Africa and now we're all over the world. But the timescales involved are, are monumental and impossible for us to have experiential um, a relationship with. The migration out of Africa, we talk about the out of Africa event, something that ha occurred 70, 60 or 70,000 years ago when a small proportion of Homo sapiens moved away from Africa and from that population derived, uh, that the rest of the, the, the peopling of the planet is, is derived. The, the migration we're talking about is occurring at a rate of you know, a few miles tops every year. And th these are events that take thousands, if not 10,000, uh, tens of thousands of, of years. Well, we talk about it using the same language as some Syrian political refugees crossing the channel in order to get here. Um, and so I think that's fundamentally problematic in understanding the broad sweep of human evolution. We use these big arrows which indicate that we were once here and then we were, we were somewhere else. When actually, you know, again, these are geological arrows in terms of their, their, uh, their, their timing. Um, so it is true that Homo sapiens is an African species, meaning that the majority of our evolution occurred within Africa. And we see that in the genetics today. And that is one of the reasons that we can talk about genetic diversity in a sophisticated way and recognize that um, the majority of human biodiversity is maintained within the African continent than rather outside of it. This is, a, I think, a more interesting map that, that sort of displays that, which is by um, uh, my colleague Mark Thomas at UCL. And, and this, is, this is one of those maps where the land masses are scaled according to whatever the metric is. And in this case, it is, it is um, genetic diversity. So there are more differences within African populations than there are in the rest of the world. And also, this is a sort of recapitulation of the earlier map. But I think it's much more informative. It shows that there's more genetic diversity within Africa than, than elsewhere. Um, so just to bring us back to pigmentation, because remember that pigmentation is, is the uh, original form of classification. It's the original phenotype used by Linnaeus and all of those other proto-scientists in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. So when we begin to look at the genes that encode pigmentation, what we find is a, a number of things which, are, um, which flatly refute the idea of, of races uh, based on pigmentation alone. And I know that, that, that race isn't, today, people who maintain a biological basis for race don't use pigmentation exclusively, but it is broadly the way we think about races 
um, uh, as a social construction today. And what we find is that there is much more variation in pigmentation within Africa than in the rest of the world. And these are studies really only done in the last 10 years or so. And when you look at the genes that underlie um, uh, pigmentation variation, what we see is that there's more diversity in pigmentation genes in Africa than in the rest of the world, which you'd expect because it supports the first statement. And what we also find is that the genes that are involved in pigmentation variation actually predate the emergence of our species possibly by another half a million years. So our skin color within Africa is far more diverse, far more varied uh, before Homo sapiens has actually emerged as a, as a distinct species as we, as we think about it today. So a bit, so sort of up some of where, where we're at at this point because I've got another 40 slides to go. Sorry. Um, this is what we mean about race being a social construction. So it is racial groups as we use and recognize them today are constructed from historical, from political and economic contexts, but not from biological ones. Um, what, we, what we see is that racialized groups don't correspond usefully to biological variation, particularly when it comes to things like pigmentation. And we also now know that pigmentation itself is an incredibly poor proxy for genetic relatedness. Right? So th this is the conclusion of 400 years worth of focusing on this very visible phenotype which we have used historically to define these racial groups. So let's go back to my two key ideas that I want you to sort of have in the back of your head, which is that science is always political and data is never neutral. And that other idea that I was talking about, which is that the language of race science and the language of genetics are not don't serve our understanding of human genetic diversity. So w w th th this works in many, many different ways. W one of them, which I think is incredibly significant for geneticists, is that our data sets, meaning our, the, the genome databases that, that exist, are hugely skewed towards European ancestry. Right? And because we know that most genetic diversity is maintained within Africa, it means that we're not actually representing genetic diversity of most humans by having data sets which, for various reasons, are focused heavily on white Europeans. Um, this is particularly important when it comes to things like genome-wide association studies, which have become a mainstay of genetics over the last 15 years or so. When we first started doing genome-wide association studies in about 2005, about 90% of our genomes that we were looking at were of white European ancestry. And incredibly, today, the number has gone up. It's, gone, it's about 92 or 93%. So we're actually going in the wrong direction in terms of understanding more genetic diversity. This is something that, that geneticists are aware of, and I think there's, you know, there's active attempts to get better diversity, particularly from, from um, uh, people on the African continent, but generally to recognize um, uh, genetic diversity from people around the world. Um, the language that we use is extremely problematic because we use words in biology that have meanings outside of the context of the specific scientific field that we're talking about. So there's conflict between geneticists, medical geneticists, medicine, anthropology, uh, when we're using the same words, right? And we don't have a shared lexicon. This is something that some of, some of us are really trying to contest. Some of our colleagues here, here tonight, we are trying to sort of spark a conversation about trying to get this language better so it, so it serves science better. Um, and yeah, and the bottom point that we don't have generally agreed norms or generally agreed standards of, of language which enable us to describe what we understand about genetic diversity because the language that we use is normalized and, and used across different fields. Here's a sort of trivial example of that, um, which is that these are PubMed citations using the words Caucasian and race. And Caucasian is an interesting one because this is a word that I think you generally understand what it means. There'll be forms that you will have filled out that included the word Caucasian as an ethnic group. Um, and I think it broadly means white European. The word Caucasian itself was invented by Johann Blumenbach as a means of describing white female beauty, right? As part of the exact white supremacist model that many of the of the, the um, race scientists of that time were um, invested in. So it's, it's scientifically meaningless. It doesn't, it doesn't have any real uh, biological utility at all and carries with it several hundred years 
of white supremacy and profound racism. So it's probably something that we shouldn't use in our scientific studies or, in fact, in any context. Um, and yet, if you look at its use in, in citations in PubMed, it is, you know, it's, it's peaking in the 2000s. Uh, similar, similar story with race. Race is not a biologically meaningful concept, and yet in biomedical literature, race is, is still um, increasingly used at this time. So let me talk about bi biology. Uh, so let me talk about race and, and medicine, because I think this is an area where it becomes much less theoretical, and the racialization of people in the historical context of race become very uh, tenable and very real world. So. Um, these are slides adapted from the lectures I give to medical students at, at, at UCL. And when we talk about race and disease, as you will be you know, very aware that race and disease are, are, are concepts which are heavily linked, and we know that diseases affect racialized groups very differently, and these differences can be biologically influenced. But they're also amplified because racialization in the West correlates very strongly with socioeconomic disparities, right? So socioeconomic disparities correlate very strongly with um, uh, with, with disease modalities overall. And so what you can end up with is that racialization can correspond with, uh, both positively, it can exacerbate, or it can reinforce racializations of diseases. So let me take you through a few examples of that, most of which you'll probably know, but it's worth going over them. Um, so we know that there are certain populations um, with, that, that have ancestral or genetic similarities um, that can show high propensity to specific diseases. And we also know that uh, populations can show resistance to specific diseases. So let, let me take you through a, a couple of these. Tay-Sachs disease is a very interesting one because this is the first racialized disease. It's first described in the 1880s by two doctors, Tay and Sachs, one in London, one in New York. And in both cases, they're identifying this disease in uh, families, in, in um, Ashkenazi Jewish families, with high degrees of consanguinity. And that makes sense with the consanguinity because you see the emergence of recessive diseases in families that have high inbreeding coefficients. Now, it's a terrible disease, and it's invariably, invariably fatal. And this is a foveal scan, where, um, uh, which is where you begin to see symptoms, but also the physical symptoms of babies failing to roll over um, and ultimately death during infancy. Now, when this was first described, in the 1880s, it was labeled the Jewish disease. So it's the first disease to really have a racialized category associated with it because it's identified in, in two Ashkenazi Jewish families. In 1886, the same symptoms, and in fact, we now know the same disease, Tay-Sachs is identified in a non-Jewish family, and it's given a different name, right? So you've got the extreme uh, association with race, the biology of race, and a specific condition to the extent that the same disease is given a different name because it's not in that racialized group of people. Um, another example that is well studied and, and, and really well understood is Tay-Sachs, uh, sorry, is sickle cell, I've done Tay-Sachs. So this is a blood disorder and it's a, a point mutation in the beta globin gene which causes these characteristic uh, red blood cells to be sickle celled. And um, if you have one copy of the, of the mutated gene, uh, then you have sickle cell trait, which is not without its problems, but is manageable. Uh, if you have two copies, then, then you're likely to have sickle cell disease, which is a terrible disease. Um, now, this is another disease that was instantly racialized when it was first described, and it was racialized as a black disease because it was appearing in populations, particularly in enslaved people or descendants of enslaved people in, in America. Um, but what we now know about sickle cell is what's known as heterozygous advantage for a specific disease, which is that it's not a racialized disease in the sense that it associates with one particular racial group, that, uh, that, that is sub-Saharan black African people, but it's very closely associated with the emergence of malaria um, and malarial zones. So when you map uh, sickle cell prevalence over malarial zones, what you see is a very strong correlation between where sickle cell occurs and where malaria occurs. And the reason for that is because heterozygous, a sickle cell trait, is protective against malaria, uh, malaria infection. So this is not a racialized disease in the sense of how it was defined initially as being a black disease. It's a disease associated with malaria. And in fact, what we see is sickle cell and other types of thalassemia and blood diseases are associated all over the world with malarial zones, including in Greece and the Middle East and South America. Um, 
Um, and yet it remains in popular culture, especially in America, as predominantly a black disease to the extent that it features in hip hop lyrics. Um, so, we, so two sort of key examples of the racialization of diseases in very specific contexts, which, which are not correct because race is not a biologically meaningful concept, but is socially constructed. So they are racialized in the sense that they relate to socially constructed groups, but not biologically in, in a meaningful way. So on top of that, those biological bases, you've also got other cases, other examples, um, causes of racial disparities and, and the racialization of medicine. Um, and the best data we have for this is in, is in the States, and I, I'll, I'll just very quickly talk through some of these. So we, we have um, well-documented examples of how perceived racism results in minority groups avoiding healthcare, particularly um, uh, African Americans. Uh, as a result of some pretty heinous crimes of medical interventions in the 20th century, such as the Tusk Tuskegee experiments, there's a, there, there is measurable suspicion about the motivations of medical interventions, government imposing uh, medical interventions on particular populations. Um, and then we have just broad um, societal, institutional, and, and systemic racism, of which there are millions of examples. I pick out just a couple casually here. Uh, so we know very, very well that there's reduced quality of care for African American patients across the board. Um, and one example, one specific example, is that African Americans are less likely to receive coronary bypass surgery and the appropriate medications by, by, by significant factors. Um, now, as a result of that, and associated with um, um, different ancestral genetics or shared genetics amongst particular groups, what we see in the racialization of medicine is that, for example, there are massively higher mortality rates in African Americans for eight out of the ten leading causes of death. An example which I, I think is really powerful, and I norm when I ask my students this, I don't show the bottom bit, so I don't read the yellow. You're all reading the yellow now, I can tell. Infant mortality in the 90s, it has changed in the last few years, for African Americans was, was two times higher than it was for European descended Americans. And you think, well, that, that's really significant. That's a significant disparity, except in one scenario where there is no disparity, and that's, yeah, I spoiled my own punchline there, that's in the military, where there is universal access to healthcare, almost like socialized medicine works. But try and say that in America and get away with it. <laughs> and then, just to bring us to, a, to, to an end, you know, let's just bring us up to date with this, seeing the results of these types of examples in the last couple of years. So, so since COVID struck, within a few months, within, by, by March or April, we were beginning to see um, significant racialized disparities um, for COVID infection and indeed death. And that was in the UK and it was in America. Uh, to, and there are some of the st stats on this. And immediately, immediately in the public discourse, the press started to talk about biological differences, genetic differences between these groups of people, which could account for the disparities that we're seeing in COVID infections and deaths. There was a huge sort of um, popular interest in vitamin D metabolism for sensible reasons, because vitamin D is associated with pigmentation and has antiviral effects. So could it be that the genetic differences between different ancestral groups or racialized groups in, for example, um, vitamin D metabolism, could that account for the disparities in, in infection and death rates among different minority groups in the West? Well, maybe in a tiny way. I, we, we don't know the answer to that really yet, but my, I think, informed uh, opinion about this is, is that if it is the case that vitamin D metabolism or some other genetic predisposition towards COVID susceptibility, if that is significant, it's going to play a minuscule role compared to the socioeconomic factors which determine medical, uh, racialization of medicine. And the reason we can say that with absolute confidence is because it's not limited to COVID. It's the same for all infectious diseases. So when we were locking down in March 2020, um, the majority of people, for example, in London, where we were seeing great disparities uh, in infection rates, um, most of the people, most of the frontline workers in hospitals, the people who um, were driving our buses, the proportion of people who are in um, minority groups is far greater. Um, 
racialized minority groups tend to live in urban centers, in multi-generational households, so therefore more ex exposing more older people, more vulnerable people. And so all of these factors are far, far better explanations about the medicalization of, of race. Because we see it's because it's not exclusive to COVID. And yet the public discourse goes, well, it's probably something to do with vitamin D metabolism and therefore it's genetic in its origin. Well, like I say, if it is, if that is involved, I think we will find that it plays a very, very insignificant role. But we like to turn to science and we like to turn to scientists to say what is the answer to this when actually we know what the cause of this and we know, we know how to fix this because they're socioeconomic and social in their construction. And indeed, on Sunday, this was revealed to us that it turns out that the way that we measure uh, oxygen flow in our blood, they don't work so well on people with dark skin. Right? This was, these, these news reports came out on Sunday. Actually, it was first described in the medical literature in, in, uh, in December 2020. So another classic example of how uh, um, there is inherent bias in medicine, because medicine is part of society, which has a measurable and significant effect on the, the, um, the clinical outcome for different groups of people. Right, one more, and then we'll stop and we'll do questions. Um, so this is the sort of up some slide. Race is a social construct, I've been through that. Race is not biologically meaningful or useful, but it has real biologically important repercussions. I think that's an interesting point worth making, right? Race is socially constructed, but because it's socially constructed, it has biological consequences. And that feels like, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a conundrum that you have to think about for a second to, to explain. We know that populations display different prevalences for certain diseases, but they don't, um, uh, co they don't meaningfully segregate with the traditional concepts of, of race. And all of those are heavily exacerbated by the social constructions of race. So just to finish up, before we go to questions, what do we do? Right? What do we do about this? It's all very well me standing here and, and, and telling you these things, and some of which you'll know, and some of which I hope that you don't know. But we are in a position where um, we, as people of power, with power, um, uh, have, there are consequences to our, to our actions. And this brings us back to the idea of science being political and data not being neutral. Because I think that it is incumbent upon scientists, people like me and other people within genetics and anthropology and, and the different domains of the human sciences, I think it's incumbent upon us to lead these conversations because nothing I've said tonight is controversial to evolutionary geneticists or human geneticists. And yet, the public discourse looks on these things and, and, and is shocked sometimes. Um, and I think it's important that we lead those conversations and I'm not in any way like uh, um, um, trying to persuade you that science and people like us will fix racism. But what I am saying is that we need to lead those conversations because if you are a racist, you can't have our tools to justify your bigotry because they don't. They do not justify racism. Racism will persist after we've persuaded everyone that race is not a biologically meaning, meaningful category. But I think it is incumbent upon scientists that we lead that conversation. And I guess in a heavily politicized way, in a way that has become, Jane used the word woke at the beginning, where words get weaponized to have the opposite meaning of their intention when they are created. But I guess that's what we mean when we talk about the difference between a non-racist and an anti-racist. And so I think it is incumbent upon biologists to be anti-racist. So let me finish with a quote from Angela Davis, which exemplifies that idea perfectly. And that is where I will finish. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was that was great. The only thing I would correct, because Alan first is sitting in the audience, <laughs> is the other thing you need is data R. Oh. Uh, plural. <laughs> data R, plural, yes. Right, Alan? Um, so, so um, thank you. That well, I, I'm, a, I, I'm a grammatical pedant, but I'm also a descriptivist. <laughs> a very strict descriptivist, so I'm sticking with data is or are just to annoy whoever's in the audience. <laughs> <coughs> well, well, you managed it for anyone that came from the first table. So that, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jane.
Um, we, we now have plenty of time for questions. Um, because uh, this is being live streamed, I'm going to ask people that are going to ask questions, please, to, to get a microphone. We'll get some people to run some microphones around. Um, but are there any questions to start with? Thank you. Now, you I like have to introduce a yourself. Wait, 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 wait. I have a policy, which is ultra, it seems like it's ultra work, but it is data-based because these are published studies. In public talks, when men ask questions first, then women tend not to ask questions. And so for the last five years, since I was introduced to this, I have enforced the policy that the first question has to come from a woman. Okay, or someone I who enforced the policy it has to come from a student. Well, if you like, yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you, Kate. Female student. You've already had one. Actually, we can have a man now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess I deserve that female privilege, right, after all these years. Um, the question that I, I mean, one of the questions that I had was, I was interested whether the European Enlightenment thinkers you mentioned noticed the difference between, like, North African Africans and, like, like not North African Africans, because, um, because, you know, just, just from a perspective of like looking at human diversity, it sure. seems that Europeans were homogenized into one group, whereas Africans were not, which is kind of interesting because now, like in the United States, for instance, people are always talking about how they're Irish Americans, Italian Americans, this Americans, that Americans, but there's only one African American, right? But then it seems like, you know, in the past, there could have been an appreciation of um, Africans of like, you know, different, I guess. Yeah. Regions. No, it's a great question, and, and, and in fact, you know, it's, it's several books worth uh, to answer it in full, and I give a very simplified narrative there. The answer is absolutely yes, but in a very limited way. And it tended to be by people who did actually travel to Africa. So there's one of Kant's main um, antagonists is a guy called Gottfried von Herder. And I, I, he, I, he, I don't think he's very well known in the UK, but he is in Germany. And um, a key part of his work as... Kant's antagonist and, and has some, someone who explored Africa was to describe that basically what we now recognize as, as a, a um, sort of accurate description of human biodiversity, um, which is that it is a recapitulation of, of geographical uh, uh, migration, right? And so he, he talks about, and this is in the 1780s, I think, 1750s, 1780s, I think, um, he talks about how there isn't one pigmentation within Africa. There is continuity in both axes, both north to south and, and east to west, which, of course, we, we now know. And although, you know, it's worth recognising that, broadly speaking, pigmentation is an adaptation to proximity to the, to the equator. But, in a, and that's a, but again, that's a sort of global climb, whereas if you look within Africa, if that was absolutely and only the case, then you'd expect to see the same pigmentation at every single latitude Latitude? Longitude. Latitude. The, the horizontal one. Um, <laughs> at which we don't. Right? We see variation across Africa. So the, the, answer is, the answer is yes, some people did recognize that, but their voices are largely drowned out by, by people who didn't acknowledge that. Now, in the modern era, and by, by which, which time I mean the, the sort of late 19th, early 20th century, and during the development of, for example, the concepts of Nordic purity, uh, which heavily feed into white supremacy in the United States and also the rise of, uh, it, during the Weimar Republic years, into um, the Third Reich. There's the, the, the fractionalization that occurs within the European populations is just breathtaking. It's, 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 it's stunning how the ranking systems can be applied at every single level. And... Uh, to the extent that Madison Grant, who is uh, he, he's one of the key eugenicists of this era, and the only Western writer cited in Mein Kampf twice, um, uh, talks very specifically about about how the, the Nordic people they, they get, they're generally called Nordic before they're before they're Aryan, uh, which is, tends to be a sort of Hitlerian um, classification. Uh, talks about that you can divide the Nordic people into different categories and the best ones are from here and the, these ones are less good and Slavs who have a bit of Nordic but they are definitely outbreeding um, people from a bit further east. So the, the balkanization that, that occurs within classifications is apparently eternal. Madison Grant talks about how the Nordic people 
populated, they, they in history migrated down to Greece, Rome, and Egypt, seeded those, those great civilizations, and then buggered off again. <laughs> right? And that is, that is what Hitler signs up to in, in Mein Kampf. So it's baffling the levels that people will go to to identify themselves as, a, as part of a particular creed, none of which is reinforced by any sort of biological evidence. Thank you. It was a long answer, sorry. Go ahead. Thanks, Rekha. Hi, thank you very much for a uh, great talk. I, I really enjoyed reading your book, which I hope you'll sign later. Sure. Um, one thing that really struck me was some of your descriptions of white supremacists and how they use race science even today to justify that supremacy. And I got a very powerful image of the neo-Nazis chugging milk, topless, saying, you know, this is our greatness. Um, it's, and amazing, I it's amazing how unattractive the master race is. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And I wondered what your view was, as someone emerging into the uh, race science debate, um, as to how you interact with and engage with people in that extreme when there is so much literature now under the guise of science justifying white supremacy. Yeah, it's a great question, and the answer is to not engage. And in some ways, I think that, although I do write about it in the book and I talk about it, I think... To what I think concepts of white supremacy that rely on bastardized or made-up science are a massive distraction from the real problems of structural racism in, in, in society, which is us, right? It's, it's not the neo-Nazis, because you, you can legitimately write them off as being not particularly influential. Well, you know, you, we, we can debate their influence. Um, but their views are... are that, that their views are so extreme and so irrational and so hate fueled that it sort of doesn't matter. There's no point in arguing with a neo Nazi. I think the more important conversations occur in our, just our normal public discourse where misplaced, misunderstood science, or just the fact that these ideas are so embedded in our culture that people who aren't racist express them, right? And we we see that everywhere. We see that we see that on, the, on on TV. We see it. We talk about it around the dinner table. We see it in our sport. There's a huge chapter about sports, which I, I love my sport. I had to persuade my editor to include sports, but I think that because it's such a big forum for seeing different people from around the world performing at extremes of, of, of ability, it's one of the arenas in which it's very easy to associate um, biological categories, bi biological characteristics, with races. Because, you know, the last when was the last time a white man uh, uh, competed in the final of the 100 metres? 1980, because I read your book. <laughs> <laughs> Someone who hasn't read the book. <laughs> come on, come on. Who was it? Was it 1990? No, it was 1980. It was 1980. Come on. I've read the book too. Yeah, we got it there. Alan Wells. Alan Wells. And that was a year, it was in Moscow, that was a year that the Americans weren't there because they, they were boycotting it anyway. So you, so you then go, well, okay, since 1980 we've had, I, I don't know how many Olympics, um, but we've never seen a white person in, in the final of, of that race. That seems like, uh, you know, for, superficially, that seems like a good data set to base, to base um, uh, a conclusion that um, people descended from West African populations largely are biologically better at sprinting and, and we, use, we use sort of poorly understood genetics and physiology about um, particular types of muscle cells to, to sometimes justify that. And I think that what's important about, about questions like that is, well, there's two questions within that. The first is, why do you think that, right? Is, does the evidence support that? And I, and I won't go into the details now because it's all in the book. Um, I think the evidence it pretty much doesn't support that as an idea. It much more supports the idea that, this, this, that, that while there is a biological component to elite athletic sporting success. It is, not, um, it is necessary but not sufficient and doesn't segregate with the traditional uh, ideas of race. Right? That's, that's point one. Um, but the second point, I think this is possibly more important but at least equally important, is what does saying that actually, uh, actually say? Well, how does that contribute to our conversations about race? 
And, and in this particular example, I think it's a very clear-cut example of how the racialization of African people during the Enlightenment, during the era of colonial expansion, specifically uh, reduced the, um, their intellect and increased their physicality as characteristics, because that allows you to subjugate a people. These people are not as smart as us, but they are stronger, and therefore they are subject they are suitable subjects, as Avicenna said, they are suitable subjects for enslavement. And so the physicality, the physicalization of black people is a really, really big area of research. And, um, and it, it, you know, we see, it, we see it in our everyday language. We see it on our TVs. We talk about people being better at dancing, better at music, right? Um, or, you know, when you see on the BBC a generic, like, shot of Kenya... It's all happy people dancing in colourful clothes. If you go to Nairobi, it's offices, with people wearing suits and working in, in front of computers, but that is not the image that is portrayed in the West because that is the, the culturally baked-in idea that is 400 years old and is derived um, from our, our ideas about, about enslavement. And th that's what structural racism is. Right? It's, it's that those, those are the ideas... That, are, that I think are the ones worth challenging. And that is where we, as scientists, need to be more robust in saying, yeah, well, is it true? And why do you think that? Thank you. Thank you. Another question. I'll try and make my answers shorter. <laughs> Hi, Adam. Thanks so much for the talk. Uh, yes. My name is Chandrima. Um, I'm a research fellow here at Wolfson. Um, so this is going to be a slightly technical question because my interests are... Uh, kind of in the decolonial science space, and so it's so great that you talked about that, but more in terms of like mathematics and physical sciences. Sorry about your maths phobia. Um, so my question is that you talked about race being a social construct, yep. and that's because you applied a system of categorization to some data that was collected in a biased way, right? And this system of categorization was biased in the way it was applied. The categories themselves were biased. Right? So I just want to know if there are any studies that apply different systems of categorization to the genetic data that you already have. And if so, how, are there any studies that map similar correlations to these new categories that would like prove, particularly in the case of AI, because you showed a slide about that, that these categorizations were arbitrary? That's a hell of a question. Thank you for asking it. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. And I don't know where to start. Um, I think the first thing to say is <laughs> I am, I'm slightly categorization phobic, right? So I'm, I'm kind of opposed to taxonomy in so many ways because in general biology fails to adhere to what Dawkins describes as the, the tyranny of the discontinuous mind, which I think is a useful way of thinking about how we try to impose rigid boxes and rigid structures on top of things which are inherently flexible. Uh, there's an argument I make in an earlier book, which is this fundamentally is associated with Linnaeus again. And I do think that Linnaeus's legacy is, is fundamentally problematic in, in current biology. Because what they're trying to do in that era is classify things as the, in a sort of platonic sense. This is what a thing is rather than what it does, which is a far more important question in, in science. I don't really care what a thing is. Is this the platonic version of a duck? Well, it takes Darwin. Well, actually, we were talking about evolution before 1859, but it takes the concept of evolution to s begin to you know, move us away from these ideas of, of, um, of pure classification and platonic forms of things, things that are created rather than evolved. Um, now, that's, that's, that's sort of hand-wavy answer, part one. Um, Elwin, do you want to help me out, help me out with this? <laughs> this is my colleague, Elwin Scali, who is a geneticist, and we, we spend a lot of time talking about this. Yeah, I, I mean, there are, there are mathematical structures that do def describe human ancestry. They're just not, they're just not simple categories. You know, they're, they're more complicated things trees and things that are even more complicated than trees. Um, and they do describe ancestry in an exact way. Um, and you can use them to construct, if you want, categories at various different levels uh, according to what you know, use you want to make of it. 
But that's the way that really that we, in, in genetics, think about ancestry, which is we do have mathematical models and they, we do have these structures. They're just not as simple as that. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the contemporary techniques which gets it gets used a lot because it's a very valid technique, um, uh, which is principal component analysis for looking at large data sets because because you know, genomes are very large data sets, and um, that you know, it to, in response to I think it was your question is one of the types of ways that we represent um, uh, the clustering of data. In a, in, in a useful way within human genetics and evolutionary genetics is one of the ways that gets adapted and bastardized by actual racists. Because superficially, you can see clustering of groups of people which, depending on how you look at it, begin to look like the traditional historical Linnaean or, or, um, uh, or, or earlier forms of racial categorization. Right? And indeed, you know, in the 1970s, there was the classic paper by Lewontin, the apportionment of of human diversity, is that what it's called? Yes, 71, um, in which he looks at one particular genetic locus and concludes that the majority of biological diversity in this one um, position in the genome is contained within a traditional racial ca uh, category rather than between them. And this becomes a huge uh, sort of fillip to, to the, 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 the quashing of the idea of biological race. And then in the 19, uh, 2002, there is a refutation from um, uh, a mathematician called Anthony Edwards, and it, which, it, which has been massively misinterpreted and has become fetishized by the race scientists or the fringe race hobbyists as being um, an example of how biological categorization is meaningful at a genetic level in, in, and looks like the traditional forms of categorization. But it doesn't really say any that, that, that at all. Um, and then different techniques, um, I mean, there's, there's, no, there's the Rosenberg study in 2001, where if you look at, anyway, I could go on, on and on about this for ages, but I think that you know, it depends on what, how, how you want to classify people. The analogy I give in one of my books is that you go to a bookshop, right, and we classify things as being you know, non-fiction or fiction, okay? I think that, that mostly robustly works. But then we say, okay, is it history or is it science? Because those are two different sections. Now, if I write a book about the history of science, well, where do you put that? It, apparently, it goes in the history section, but we deliberately designed the cover to look like a historical book because they sell much better. <laughs> um, uh, or, you know, you can, you can pick out individual words I in the book. I, I spent ages because I talk about Darwin and I talk about the beagle in there. I spent ages looking for books that contain the word beagle. Um, of, and I found one, which was um, Portrait of the Artist by James Joyce, and one which was a kid's book about dogs. <laughs> At which point you go, well, okay, if beagle is your, is your locus, my categorization includes all people, all, all people that have beagle, all books that have beagles in them. Or you could do, you know, you refer to the milk um, uh, lactase persistence. Like, you know, most people on Earth and most people historically have not been able to process milk after weaning. But most people of European descent and populations that have past pastoralism like the, like the Tutsi in Rwanda, the Middle Eastern camel herders also have similar mutations which allow them to, to um, process milk after weaning. So you could legitimately base your entire societal structure and bigotry, if you wanted to, on whether or not you could process milk after weaning. And that could be you know, your selection criteria for total domination of, of the world. If, it would be a, a, a stupid thing to do, but it's no less um, irrelevant to classification than, than picking something like pigmentation or the clustering of certain specific genetic loci. So I, I don't know whether I answered your question, but I... I I'm kind of down with taxonomy. <laughs> um, we, we've got time for, for, for a few more questions that are coming up. Maybe you could make them okay. slightly shorter. Shorter. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, thanks. That was a very diplomatic way of saying shut that. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Adam. Thanks for coming. Um, my name's Anawa, and I'm a, a student here. I'm a second year undergrad. Um, I have a question. It's, I guess it's more about discourse and the use of words, whether they actually um, change the way that we interpret things. Um, but I'm a politics student, and a lot of the time, um, people use the word race 
and ethnicity interchangeably. Sure. Um, and what's really interesting, I think, when you gave the example of the Hutu and the Tutsi, is that in that case, people typically refer to that as two different ethnicities as opposed to two different races. Sure. Um, and I think as we've kind of um, spoken more about race in the last few years, um, there's a movement away from the use of race because people feel as though it's beginning to be debunked and I guess a take up of the use of the word ethnicity as though it's more scientific, more rigid. Um, and so for instance, if we say race is a social construct, cool. If you were to say ethnicity is a social construct, I think a whole bunch of people go, what, huh, since when? Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess my question to you is, what is the difference between those two words, if there is any difference biologically, sure. um, or um, I guess genetically? Um, and what would you say about the use of ethnicity in, in the place of race? Is, is that as problematic as a, you know, a, classif um, as a pl classification? Well, I think, I think you've characterized the problem perfectly by asking that question, because the answer is no. There is, so I think in many uses, ethnicity has simply replaced the word race in recognition that race is not something that we should use in science. So there's plenty of examples where actually when people are saying ethnicity, well, they're ac they actually mean traditional form forms of race. We see, we've looked at this quite carefully with, with my colleague Alwin, um, and, and see that there are different uses. Ethnicity means something very different in within genetics, within the public sphere, within anthropology, and there isn't a shared language about that. We're trying to work out how to uniform, unify that language so it becomes, so it has utility. That's the, that's the key thing. Um, the other thing is that language evolves, and it's, it's, it's hard to keep pace with how people, you know, we joked about the being, my being a prescriptivist, descriptivist, not prescriptivist grammatically well that that's a hard thing to do when we're talking about these sorts of categories or these this sort of language um race it, as a term as a pseudoscientific term in the 19th century and and for much of the 20th century didn't mean what we generally refer to race today as and in fact you know darwin has the word races in his in the title the subtitle of the origin of species he doesn't mention humans in that at all. He's talking about races of pigeons or cabbages. Um, and it's sort of synonymous with types or subspecies or some vague categorization which is difficult to pin down today. So the word itself has radically changed its meaning within 150 years and continues to evolve. And I don't know what the answer to, to your question is because you can't impose language upon people. We can't decree because we publish an article in Nature, that this is what these, la these, these words mean here on in. They are used by people in different contexts and in different ways. I think what we have to be work hard at is to try and work out where the similarities or differences are between uh, different disciplines, including politics, such that they don't confuse, they don't, they don't confuse, they enlighten rather than confuse. And, I, I, and that is a public discourse that, is, that just needs to be continuous. Shorter questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm Muzaffar, uh, asking the question as a psychiatrist, and I'm an alumnus of the college. So the first one is, um, you see in this enlightenment figures that they, they start with pigmentation, some physical characteristics, and then they jump to the behavior right away. Yeah. And I think in our public discourse, there is something like this mental shortcut. Uh, first question is related to your second book possibly, how do we address that? And the second one is the commercial genetic testing almost always comes with some behavioral uh, sure. phenotypes. And is there a frontier there? Yeah, so, so that, it's the same question. Oh, I like that question a lot. Um, so I think it's a much broader answer than just talking about race and the history of race science. It is a cultural adherence to a kind of biological essentialism that we've moved away from in academic science 20 or 30 years ago, but is so culturally ingrained that it's just almost impossible to shake because what, what is genetics? It's the study of sex and families and inheritance, right? And we've only had an understanding of the mechanic, mechanics of that for 20 or 30 years, right? So we're fighting against one of the most significant narratives that humans have, which is where we fit into this grand narrative and why do I look and behave the way I, I do, compared to a modern understanding of genetics, which is, based, you know, in short, very, very complex and difficult to understand. But what, what the reason I think that the ancestry testing kits have been a disservice to the public understanding of science is because they reinforce the notion of biological essentialism, right? That you can 
you, you spin a tube and it tells you where you're from, right? It doesn't tell you where you're from. There isn't a way of doing that. It tells you where on earth people who have similar DNA to you live today. And from that, we infer that you might have had an ancestry from, from those locations. Now, furthermore, our biological relationship to almost all of our ancestors is almost zero, right? We, we, we literally carry DNA from only half of our ancestors from something like 10 or 11 generations ago. So your actual biological bloodline ancestors, you have no particular significant genetic relationship with. And yet, with those types of ancestry testing kits, the narrative we tell ourselves is, oh look, I have Viking ancestors. And that explains the following characteristics in me. <laughs> and what we know about ancestry really is that while there is ge geographical um, hubs where a, a large proportion or bigger proportions or different proportions of your ancestry comes from, we're actually, we are descended from everyone um, over a very short period of time. And um, our, our ancestors are from all over the world over, over a space of, of just a, you know, a couple of thousand years. So again, it's a cultural adherence to a biological determinism which hasn't been borne out either by genetics or genetic genealogy or even genealogy it, itself. But narratives are very strong. You know, we're, we're, we're storytelling machines and science is fundamentally uninterested in neat stories. Thank you. I am really sorry that we don't have time for more questions. Um, as Adam says, all the best stuff is done in the bar. So we've all done the keep awake if you can during the conference bit. Um, <laughs> that's, that's also from his book. Um, uh, and, and now uh, we, we, the evening goes on. There, there, there's three sections. So um, for those who, are, who have been invited to the meal, um, if you'd like to make your way up to the combination room, somebody in college that's also from the college will take you up the com combination room for a drink. For those of you who are here uh, and not coming to the meal, I would invite you to get a drink from the back, bring it back in here. One of us will grab a glass of red or white for Adam uh, and, and have a conversation with Adam here. And then after the dinner that we're going to have, uh, I shall be taking Adam to the college bar. So uh, join us again in the bar af after that. For, for And he may have had more than the one glass of red that I'm going to bring him now. And there. So could you, could you first of all join me in, in really thanking Adam? It's been tremendous. Thank you so much. So, so as I say, the people who, who are going to dine, if you'd like to make your way up to the combination room, can you take some of our guests from the college? Everybody else, grab a drink, bring it back in. What, what do you want, Adam, red or white? Red. We'll get you a glass of red. And thank you. Please come.